When I was 15 years old, my school library invested in a book which they put up in the kind of new acquisitions shelf as you walked into the library called Hearts of Darkness by a photographer called Don McCullen. And the book could have been tailor-made for an adolescent boy. It was a, a book full of the most exciting pictures I'd ever seen. I was a, a amateur photographer, just learned to develop my own pictures with um, splashing fixer and developer all over myself in the dark room and pushing Alfred FP4 film and doing all that stuff. Um, and this book was extraordinary because it, in a single hardback book, crystallized the great conflicts of the 60s and 70s and seemed to contain all the tragedy, all the horror, all the excitement, all the aggression uh, of the previous 20 years. Uh, and uh, finally met Don 20 years later when I was writing a book called From the Holy Mountain in the same village as Don, <laughs> 100 yards from his house, and used to walk past his house every day. Um, and you'd already sort of begun sort of archiving uh, and doing nature photography, uh, doing landscape photography. Yes. You had, Don had already left, um, in a sense, the war photography period behind you. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember longing to ask him all this stuff. Anyway, so now my opportunity has come now. <laughs> Very exciting to be on a stage with one of one's childhood heroes. Um, we have, I think, um, images here. Can we put up the... Is it up? Are they coming up yet? Technicians, can we have some technicians? Some help, please. We need Don's photographs. Okay. Have we got a technician somewhere? Here we go. So, when, is this the right, right one to start with? We have the tramp from. Okay. Yeah. I, no, is that, is I, that the first? Or no, it wasn't, but never mind. Can we go to the first one of the photographs, please, which is some. No, we've got a picture. We've got the wrong one, though. We want the first picture, which is okay. some youths in a burnt out yeah. house. Can we get number one rather than just random pictures from the order? No, so we're in trouble. So let's just probably go for it. Is it, is it on this, is it on the, um, is it controlled from here? So can we go back to the first picture of the... Can I just... Here we are, okay. we go. we're on. Done? Okay. So we've got the cover picture. There we are. That's it. Okay. So, Don, you grew up in working-class London during the Blitz. You were a war, a war child yourself. Um, yes, I was five years of age when, when the bombs started raining down on my uh, tenement neighborhood. And uh, it was quite frightening, really. I mean, five years, you're still a baby, really. And uh, so my mother promptly sent me off to the, to the countryside where I live today in Somerset. Um, but do you actually have, can you remember bombs going off? Can you remember the sound of breaking glass and... Oh, I, I could, I mean, it was quite exciting. Uh, you know, the, the German bombers would drop tinfoil to, to confuse uh, radar and all kinds of other things. And um, at the same time, I was crammed in an air raid shelter, which was built very quickly in the back of people's gardens. And I, living in a tenement block, I shared it with, you know, four other families. I don't know how we all got in, but it was... And we would sit, and we had a common kind of goal. We, we wanted to stay alive, really. So <laughs> we, we somehow were much more tender to each other. That's through the eyes of my childhood. And my mother and, and, the, and the other people upstairs uh, would have had... When you live in a tenement slum, you would have differences, but they were all cast aside during this moment of, of great fear. And, um, uh, so um, it was a good way for me to start, really, because I, was, I wasn't to know that at the age of five I would go to many, many wars for the last 50 years that I have done. And you described once um, picking up pieces of shrapnel on your way to school. And... Well, um, I used to go to a little primary school, and when we got there in the morning, we'd we would see all the exploded shells which would have been rained up uh, uh, towards the enemy aircraft, the German bombers, which would then fall down, and we would pick up various chunks of this stuff. It was horrible stuff. You wouldn't want to be hit by it. So um, we'd go to school, and 
it would be like showing each other kind of postcards or something, cigarette cards. So it you used to have to form a collection. Did you used to have? Yeah, we yeah. used to have a collection. It was it, it all looked very prehistoric because it was mangled metal that was meant to destroy it. So it was a, a bizarre thing looking back on it, really. But it took our minds off of the, the dangers. But this landscape of, of the bombed out. Which bit of London are we talking? Well, this is where I, I lived in North London, and this was the house at the bottom of my street where I lived. So it gives you an idea, you know, the, the, the slum side of, of life. And uh, so one Sunday, by, by this stage, I'm 20 uh, years of age, and I've done my military service, which I didn't want to do, because I didn't want them cutting my hair off. And, um, and I went, I brought a camera back from the Royal Air Force, uh, I was in the war in Kenya uh, for several months. And then one Sunday morning, as you can see, these boys are extraordinarily well-dressed for, you know, uh, people who eventually, a couple of people in this picture, went to prison for armed robbery. So, um, you know... And this is a gang? It's a gang yeah. of boys. They called themselves the governors, which means people who governed the area. And it was rather pretentious and arrogant, but... Um, and then one Sunday night, when I wasn't there, I was with my fiance, uh, another gang came. You see, in, in the 60s in England, it was very tribal. There were, you know, you wouldn't go to their area, they wouldn't come to you. It was almost like being in Africa. Um, so they came... Or Afghanistan. Uh, yes, oh, yeah. Afghanistan. <laughs> um, a gang of boys came to this area where this building was, uh, the policeman tried to step in and stop this gang about to attack each other. Uh, and a member from the other side stabbed the policeman in the back and he died there and then on the bottom of the, on the street. And uh, the man who did it was eventually hung uh, in, in the, a local prison, which was quite close to where I lived also. So my life really basically, as uh, the actual, uh, the, the, the footprint of it started on a, on a theme of violence, really. And you took this to the Observer yourself? You, you took the photograph and you brought it to the newspaper? Well, I went to the Observer through other people's advice, because I never read the Observer newspaper, not where the district we came from. And the, the editor said, did you take this and will you do more? And I was actually arrested by the police one night, because they said they saw me with this rather good camera. And they said, where did you get that camera? We have a report of a stolen camera in the area. I, it was nonsense, really. but. The police where I lived, they never endeared themselves to us at all. We hated them, really. And um, they, were, they was always smacking us around. So um, it was, a, it was a, a really big struggle at the beginning of my life, but it was not a struggle compared with the, the things I eventually saw covering all the great wars of the world. And from East London, next, next stop as a photographer, I mean, you, you, you went to Berlin deliberately to to photograph the, the wall going up. I went to Berlin in 1961. I was sitting in a cafe in Paris. I saw a very famous photograph of an East German soldier jumping the barbed wire with all his um, helmet and his, his Kalashnikov and his boots. And um, I was looking over some guy's shoulder in this uh, cafe floor in, in Paris. And I, and I said to my young wife at the time, would you mind if I went to Berlin? Because we didn't have any money. I knew I had 70 pounds in the bank. And by the time I worked it out, bought the air ticket, and, and arrived at Tempelhof Airport, which, by the way, was Hitler's airport. Um, I don't know what made me do this. It was something inside me saying, you've got to do this. I went to the Observer, and they said, we're not interested. And I said, OK, well, I'm going anyway. So, and, and, I mean, we all know now about the building of the Berlin Wall, but this was, this was something new. Was it on the front pages yet, or was it, it was international? No, it was, it was certainly edging its way to the... I mean, we're looking at a possibility of the Third World War here. So it was a, a developing into a and massive... And what date is this? 1950? 1961. 61. So there I am in, in Friedrichstraße, and this is Friedrichstraße where I... Went. I particularly like this elegant-looking German woman that's walking down the road. It's not the machine gun that I'm interested in. I'm looking at the way this woman's dressed in almost a 40s-looking uh, kind of uh, Dior style. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, um, I came back from Berlin and, and the Observer gave me a contract for uh, 15 guineas a week, which is slightly Dickensian, but uh, it basically amounts to 20 pounds or 2,000 rupees in today's money, I think. Um, and I, I which wasn't bad money. 
Well, I, I was married, remember? I mean, 20 quid a week, you know, and I was still living in the same slum tenement that, you know, I lived in as a child. We had two rooms at the top. So, you know, life had the struggle of life was still on, on an onward going situation for me. Um, so I had to learn. By the way, I was never a, really a photographer. I, I had to learn about photography, and it was later known as photojournalism, which is quite fancy, really. Because I was a boy... That, In a sense, your generation invented it. Well, I suppose people... No, I think Life magazine invented it, really. But, but I had to adjust... All those pictures of Kappa in, in, in the uh, Spanish Civil War, or that, yeah. that would be... Stuff. Well, I, I wanted to inherit Kappa's uh, laurels because he died in Indochina in 1954. He stepped on a landmine and, you know, one of the most famous photographers in the world suddenly went up in a puff of smoke. And I thought, there's a vacancy there. And I know it sounds, it sounds rather kind of mercenary, but you know, I, I, I moved into a mercenary world and it was, you know, dog eat dog. So on the other hand, without being, you know, big headed or slick, I, I wanted to retain an emotional kind of moral attitude about what I was doing. I didn't want people wagging the finger at me and saying, you know, you know you're a mercenary, you're taking money photographing war. By the way, I only, I only ever took, uh, my money, uh, which was paid to me through newspapers, as I was a member of the National Union of Journalists, so I never got any extra money than the guy who stood outside number 10 Downing Street in London doing the ministerial thing. So, um, you know, I... But I, your first war as such was Cyprus, huh? The Cyprus Civil War? I, I went to the office and the editor said, would you consider going to Cyprus? Well, I was actually stationed near the city of Limassol um, in Cyprus. And by the way, these photographs you're looking at now are the, the pictures I did in between wars. I went, in, this is in 1963, I wanted to show that England was not a nation of, of richness and, you know, wealth. Because many times when I've been to countries like this and Africa and places, and in conversation with normal people saying, oh, well, there's a lot of poverty in England, they'd never believe you. And this was taken in, in West Hartlepool in County Durham, I, was, I slept in my car one night, and, it, and when I woke up, um, my legs were, I thought, I, I thought I was sleeping on Everest, my legs were dead. It was so cold, and then I saw this, this foundry, this steel foundry. It's such a famous photograph, I, I honestly didn't know you'd taken it. it was, it's one, it's well, an iconic photograph now. That, well, it has yeah. a nasty ring about it, this yeah. photograph, and before the man came into the photograph, I thought I could be looking at a place called Birkenau, which is the the crematoria where yeah. millions of Jewish people were killed. So yeah, my mind was constantly matching history and things I'd seen visually because, you know, this whole conference is about uh, literature here. And so I'm slightly the, the intruder in all this. But, you know, I'm still telling stories. We made a special exception for you and Steve McCurry. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I particularly like walking the streets of cities, which I... My poor old feet won't handle these days, but um, whenever I walk, the, this is, by the way, the, um, in, near the East, East Orgate, which is near Liverpool Street Station, there were vagrants. We know who, it probably from the Monopoly board. Sorry? We know it from the Monopoly board. East Orgate was the, was <laughs> oh, the, the lowest value. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, um, I call this man Neptune because he looks like the Roman sea god under the sea. He's got this wonderful, he's a very handsome Irish woman, he has wonderful blue eyes, but it, he was mentally handicapped, really. He was, he was a lost soul, and he was sleeping by a fire at night. So if I don't bring the emotion into my thinking and my, my imagery, I'm failing uh, my, my, what I'm yeah. trying to, to express, really. Uh, and of course, you know, there's one thing about England, you can always count upon the eccentrics and the, and the loonies. <laughs> um, you, you'll find one in every, every street corner, and they never fail to please you. Uh, this man uh, was, used to collect money for children, and, and the moment I took this photograph, he said, I'll go and get some other animals, and <laughs> the cat pounced on one of the mice and uh, killed the mice. And when he came back, I said, there's been a problem. He said, what's that? I said, that cat's killed one of the mice. And he picked the cat up and he started smacking it like Tom and Jerry around the face. <laughs> and I thought, he's not so nice anyway, this man. <laughs> this yeah, man. Cyprus, here yes. we are. Yeah. So this is your first real moment. You've seen war as a soldier in Kenya, but this is now you, for the first time, 
faced with a conflict? Well, I was in the Air Force in Kenya, right. and the great thing about my life is, is that I can really feel relaxed about the fact that I never harmed anybody. I mean, I occasionally carried a weapon, but you know, have, you know, what followed after my military service, I saw thousands of people being killed. So this was my first baptism of war. Strangely, the photograph looks like a Hollywood. It looks uh, pure Hollywood. <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't show you, you know, I don't like to, to glamorize war because it would be so easy to glamorize war. And if you think that's a ridiculous statement, it, it, it partly is and it's partly not. You know, I've seen such horrible things in war. And when I say occasionally to people, you can see beauty in war. And it's the beauty in somebody crying. It's the beauty of somebody caring and handling a wounded person or giving someone medical water, simple things like that. And yet, if you walk into a, a place in, in, in the war in Biafra and see hundreds of children barely able to stand on their legs, um, that's the different side of war. So just quick, go back, go back if you could to the, to the, the if you like, the Hollywood photograph. What's actually going, we're going forward. Oh dear, sorry, uh, going wrong now. Yeah. Okay. What's going on? There's yeah, some guy gonna, running out of a door. It's not going to work. Shall I try up here again? So yeah, so this is, this is in Limassol. This is in, so is in, in Limassol. I arrived in the Turkish quarter and um, I took this photograph and I was immediately arrested by the police. And so I spent the night, all the other journalists had gone somewhere else that day. So in fact, I had this all to myself. The Turks and the, and the Greeks were facing yeah. off. Yeah, the Greeks were attacking uh, the, the people in, in this lovely little town. And um, you know, I've always tried to take the place of the underdog in wars. I always feel it's my duty to be with those be, being oppressed by you know, the violence and, and, and the so persecution. At, the, at this stage, you have a, before the Turk, Turks intervene, before yeah. Turkey intervenes, you have the, the Turks effectively being ethnically cleansed by Greeks. Yes, and I, I went to various villages during, by the way, this is 1954, I went to various villages in the area where the, where the Greeks were attacking. And it was terrible, you'd walk into a, a house and see dead bodies all over the floor, and um, it, it's... This is part of the kind of unraveling of the Ottoman Empire, which then continued in Serbia, yes. continued in Bosnia. And yeah, that, I, I didn't realize that there would be a wealth of events that would be coming in my life, which would be at the expense of other people's lives, by the way, which I was fully aware of. You know, building a name in photography at the expense of other people's lives is, is not a very comfortable place to sit. And, um, I've been consciously aware of, of my, my moral duty and what I could do and what I shouldn't do. So, and when, you know, I've occasionally won awards which I feel really uncomfortable that I've accepted. You, you, yes, you've you talked in some of your interviews about the, the dangers of voyeurism. Well, I think, what is voyeurism? It's a huge and massive intrusion, really. You know, nobody invites you to to come into their What's home. happening here? So th well, at this point, you're in someone's house and there's someone being shot. Uh, there are three, two brothers dying. The man in the foreground was just been married to the lady holding the towel. He's just entered the room and found me there. And in the back room, the father of these two sons was also murdered. And she's so, just, seen, just seen her husband she, dead on the she floor. She just burst in and uh, it was... I was in this warm Mediterranean room with this warm blood and this, this woman crying. and. I, I felt, you know, how, do, how am I going to get away with this? What are they? They might attack me. Uh, they didn't really. And I, it's just, I can still smell that blood to this day in that warm room. It's very strange. So um, this is your. This is the first time now. I mean, in a sense, this is you um, for the first time doing what you will do for the next twenty years. More, more than that. Yeah, thirty, you? forty years. <laughs> did, did it? I mean, were you the adrenaline rush of war? Did that grab you? Uh, what, what, not, not, why were you doing this? Why were you putting yourself in danger? Because I knew, and I have to be very honest here, I knew this was a stepping stone in my life as a photographer. I knew that it could only enhance my... my, my and that's really wrong, really, but at least I'm honest enough to tell you this. Um, you know, one it, was builds, you could, it was something you could do as a way of making money, making a name. It, no, not the money so no. much because of the NUJ situation. <laughs> um, the, the trouble is it was never money in my... I've spent the whole of my life not worrying about making money. I've always found money immaterial. Mm. I've loved photography. It, it's been a, more than a passion. I've been married to photography for the last 60 years. So there was never a money interest. It was purely, 
love. It was a love affair with something. And photography is very magical. You're alone in the dark room because I process all my own film and make my own prints. I'm alone in this embryonic womb of, of red light. Um, and I'm alone there, you know, one to one against the print emerging, which have n not always been very nice images to look at. There is a magic in developing your film. If you're there listening to classical music, I mean, on a winter's day in England, what better place could you be hiding in? It's Today, a, when you can just take Photoshop or Snapseed and you can turn a color photograph into black and white I or don't do that. burn in the sky. I don't do that. But I it? miss the stuff of the dark room. <laughs> Seeing that picture emerge slowly um, in the developer and the... Well, of course, eventually I got to the biggest war in the world in Vietnam. And, um, it, so this, it, is, this is, at this stage, the describe, set it, for those who don't know about Vietnam, just to set up the Well, the you, ar you arrived in Saigon, and I, I was working for the Sunday Times by that stage. I'd left the observer. You arrived in Saigon. You went to the, the American military. They gave you a, an accredited rank, complimentary rank of major, which was thrilling for me, because when I left the Royal Air Force in England years before, I, I had the lowest rank you could. <laughs> so there I was suddenly with the rank of major. And you could fly on helicopters anywhere you want, almost like taking a, a taxi. I expect most of us probably know Vietnam more from Apocalypse Now and, uh, and all those Vietnam War movies. But you actually were in there, in the helicopters. Yes, I was. So I, I went to the great Tet Offensive in 1968 and I wound up in the imperial city of Hue, where these American marines thought it would be a 24-hour operation. Again, just a bit of context. This, is, this, is, this was a crucial moment, like a sort of Stalingrad moment, wasn't it, when both sides put, were, were shoving everything they had at one place. Well, uh, we were up against what they call a North Vietnamese regiment, who were the best soldiers in the world. These are men who ran around with homemade shoes, which was called the Ho Chi Minh Thousand Milers, because they were made from car rubber. You'd cut a lump out of the car tire that was, you know, an old tire, and th that was their footwear. So, and they had a big sack of rice, and, and you know, they were the most courageous and the most amazing people. And so, there you had the American army, which takes um, nine men to put one man in the field as a soldier. So, you, this great nation of America was up against this poor nation. The only difference was that, you know, Ho Chi Minh could afford to lose a million people where the average American president, you know, was having a hard time explaining the death of 50,000 soldiers. But this was, in a sense, the, the Stalingrad moment. Every, this is a huge battle, and you're sitting there with your camera in, amid shell fire tracer, people being killed all around you. Well, a what, different scale to what you'd seen in Cyprus. What happened was that um, I got there with very little um, equipment. I had a, a military uniform, which I bought on the black market so that I could blend in. And then, it sounds horrible to say this, but each day I would go to the field hospital where there would be a mountain of cast off clothing from the injured. And I would get, one day I got a helmet, the next day I got a bulletproof jacket, and, and I got a water canteen. And so, so um, and then I looked like an American soldier, which was quite dangerous. Again, one of the iconic images from your, I mean, everyone knows this picture. This, yeah. is, a, this is a shell shocked American GI. Yes, in a way, you have to be careful as a photographer not to make something tragic look too iconically beautiful. And I've, I've always been aware of composing my photographs so that they, they can be looked at. I mean, a lot of the things I've taken can only be written off as atrocities. So, you know, people don't want to look at, at atrocity pictures at, at the best of times. So I want to to captivate your kind of interest and hold you, even for a split second, a few seconds, rather than have you reject what I do. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a danger of glamorizing war, because that's what Hollywood did. And I was weaned on Hollywood as a child after the Second World War had gone away. So I had to be careful not to be promoting war. Just tell me, though, about these two images. We've had the shell shock soldier. Who's this? This is, this is, just, this is after the battle. I, by the way, I, I was told this battle would last 24 hours. I was there two weeks later. And as you say, Stalingrad, the, the imperial city of Wei, this 12th century Mandrian looking, um, uh, uh, oh, it was just an amazing place. It was bombed to smithereens and flattened. It's been rebuilt since. But I mean, it was a Stalingrad situation. And uh, I could have pointed my camera in any direction. I, I live like an animal sleeping next to dead bodies. 
and one day there was a huge shelling and myself and another man, we ran and we jam jumped into a, a, a foxhole or a, a, a depression in the ground and I said to him, it smells here. And I said, why is it so bouncy? And we were actually sitting on the body of a dead North Vietnamese soldier who was covered with a film of, of earth. And it reminded me of all quiet on the Western Front when the, 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 the French soldier was killed by the German soldier. You know, in war, anything is possible. You embrace the dead, you sleep next to the dead. And when you come away, you are almost half dead yourself, even though There's a photograph of you in that... In, uh, anyone who wants to learn more about Don's work, um, incidentally, can go to YouTube. There's an absolutely extraordinary BBC documentary on him on YouTube, just called McCullen. Um, and, uh, and it fills in the gaps of what we'll be doing. Most wonderful, wonderful documentary I've seen in, in a year. I mean, extraordinary. This photograph here, yeah. you see, this, a, a photograph like this says a lot more than the average you know, image of a man firing a gun, which is pointless, really. This photograph actually tells you about humanity. Talk uh, about this photograph. Well, it's a man praying, uh, a Catholic man praying on his knees in a big air base called Da Nang in Vietnam. But, you know, I live in a country where, in the Christianity sense, we've lost our faith. And, you know, whether you believe or you don't believe, and I see a lot of belief in this country. I was at a huge festival the other day um, in, in Sagar Island in, in the, the Bay of Bengal, and to see 600,000 people who, who trust in their faith was extraordinary. Uh, because in a country where I come from, you know, apart from the Islamic people who live there who believe in their faith, you know, the Christian church is very much almost vanishing before your eyes. So when I see a thing like this, and by the way, this was taken in 1968, a lifetime ago, yeah. um, it, 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 it somehow gives you hope in a way that, you know, people still believe in. Just, in just to return to the Tet Offensive, I, I, there was some statistic in the documentary about the casualties of, of the lot you went in with. You had how many troops? Oh, you went in uh, I went, the, the company I was fighting with on the wall had 140 men, and when we left, we, we had 70 left. 50% uh, casualties? That's only one company. The whole battalion suffered that. So the North Vietnamese soldiers vanished in the night after day 12. They vanished. They somehow vanished and got out of this circle that entrapped them. And, you know, they were remarkable people, these soldiers. They, and one day, there was a dead soldier. I'd been sleeping on the other side of a wall, and I didn't know that he'd been sleeping there permanently. He'd been dead for a few days. And I went out of my little foxhole a different way and found his body. Is this the famous photograph of the man with, the, with the, his girlfriend? Yes, his possession. Beautiful picture. Well, I have to admit that what happened, some two other soldiers came along looking for souvenirs, and you could only say they were looting his body, really. And they picked all his possessions up, and they threw them down. And, and when they went away, I thought, you know, scandalous, really. You should admire this man's courage fighting for his country. So when they went away, I shoveled together his little possessions, and they were pathetic. He had a, a picture of a girlfriend, a, a wallet. A mother, maybe, or yeah, yeah. Daughter, daughter, sister, girlfriend, I don't know. But all his story was there and then told by me by bringing these things together. And, and his dead body. Against his yeah. dead body. Yeah. I mean, it, it was the only time I've ever arranged something, but I couldn't do otherwise because I had to make this statement because he couldn't make it, he was dead. And in the case of Vietnam, your photographs, which were given a huge coverage in the news, Sunday Times magazine, That's right, which, yes. was a, which was a kind of at, it, at, its, at the beginning was one of the great sort of changes in, in modern journalism. Mm -hmm. Sunday Times magazine was the first to really do serious reportage, to shove it all over the front page, to give it space, to put pictures over two um, pages. And, yeah. it, and it was an absolutely major moment for journalism. And, and Don was the poster boy at this time, was on the cover every week. <laughs> Um, but do you actually ch you change things? I mean, you, it was for a British paper, not an American one. Uh, it's strange enough that uh, William said that helped to change things. I have to say this, and don't be surprised or be surprised. I don't think I really did change very much, really, because if you look at what's happened after the, these events in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know, you had all wars in Africa where mad in boys of 12 and 14 were chopping off the arms of babies at roadblocks. 
they were so crazed on drugs, and then what's going on now in the Middle East? Um, did I change anything? Oh, I don't. But in the microclimate of Vietnam and the American perception of Vietnam? Well, you had Afghanistan, you've, you've had the Iraq war, you've had Syria. Uh, you know, it, it's Obviously, no, no one can stop war in general, but you, you did in, bring a spotlight on the suffering going on in Vietnam in a way that, that simply hadn't been seen before. Yeah, but Vietnam, I went to the Biafran War, which was much more terrible. I mean... Where are we here now? Where there's a, a man throwing a hand grenade, which is pointless picture, really. He got shot immediately, he took this picture in the hand. It looks like a sort of, sort of image of the Olympics or something. Oh, I couldn't agree yeah, with yeah. you more. It looks like one of Lenny Riefenstahl's, you know, the, the will yeah. of triumph. And, yeah. um, that's the trouble, you see, about, I'm saying about glamorizing. Um, the people who pay the highest price in war, not the soldiers, it's always the civilians, always. They're the last to be told, you know, uh, what's about to happen to them. So they're caught out. This man was in a bunker, and the American soldiers, it, it, that's what they were trained to do, threw a hand grenade in. Luckily, they survived this family. But, I mean, I, of course I tried to make an iconic picture out of this, because I wanted you to see it and remember it and never forget it. So would you sort of describe yourself as an anti-war photographer, do you think, rather than a, a war photographer? When I first started, I, I was carried away by the excitement. And then this war we're looking at now, the Biafran War, I think you might agree there's yet another iconic statement. But just let me stop you there and say that this woman is 24 years of age who would never have survived this camp I went into, which are hundreds of dying people. Again, just to, just to give it a bit of context here, we're talking Nigeria in 1970. Uh, this was 1968, the same year I went to Vietnam. Whilst I was photographing this young woman, who looks like a grandmother, I saw some writing on the back of the wall, and I, I was curious. I thought, what could be that writing? And when I finished this photograph, I went down behind the woman and read the writing on the wall. And it's something that's never left my memory. And it said, today I am reborn. And I thought, there am I looking at a person about to die, a young person. With a child who's about to die. Yeah, of starvation, which is the most horrible death. And then I see that somebody has scribbled these. And those few words were more important to my mind at the time, because, I, I, because it put me into total confusion. I, was, I didn't know what to do, what to think, how to respond. And this was a man-made situation. Unlike, in a sense, Vietnam, which is a, a kind of conflict that grew out of control, this is, this is politicians deliberately starving an area? Well, because the Biafrans thought they had the oil area, and they broke away, thinking they're going to keep it all. This is possibly the worst photograph I've ever taken in my life. It was a nine-year-old albino boy. And if you don't think um, the war itself was bad enough, if you're born as an albino in Africa, um, you pay the price from the word go in life. You're looked upon as a freak. And even today in Africa, I was reading recently, they were hunting down albinos to kill them because they thought they were some evil kind of spirit. And so this boy fixed his eye on me. He's, he's holding a, a corned beef tin, which he'd licked dry. He'd taken every last taste out of that piece of tin. And then he was staring at me. I thought, I can't look at him. I've got to get away from this boy. And I went off and I spoke to a... Uh, Médecin Frontier doctor, I mean, he was just giving us a little briefing, and then suddenly somebody touched my hand, and I looked down, and this boy was holding my hand. I, I thought I was going to break down. So I found a sweet in my pocket, and I gave him a sweet. I thought, please go away. And he went away and stood over there, and he was licking the sweet, looking at me. And, you know, I haven't printed this picture in my dark room for 25 years. I don't want that boy spoiling my day in the dark room. You know, to, to imagine that... Listening to you talk, this was the thing that haunt, haunted you most. The, the di more, than, more than adults killing each other, children dying of starvation helplessly in the camp seemed to have moved you. Well, because I used to go back to England and I had a young family of my own who would sometimes refuse their meals. So, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I was constantly throwing myself into these places. Here's my, my own fault for going, in a way. What, what do you think the price has been on you? I mean... Um, Obviously, it's a choice you made yourself. You could have, you could have got off and, and been a fashion photographer. Yeah. Um, 
the price on the, the price on me it's hung out with model. <laughs> I, I think it's turned me into a nicer human being, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was never looking for profit. People I talk was, about the brutalization of war. You, you, in a sense, you feel that war saved you, in a sense. I think it. I think it. It, it somehow programmed me to look out for what I did next. I didn't want to be clumsy. I did. When I was in these situations, by the way, we just moved to Northern Ireland, which we'll talk about in a minute, but to end your question, I think what it did, it, it programmed me to try and become you know, a much better person than the man I started out growing up in, in, the, in the early days in my youth. In that you, you saw so many lives being cut short and you, want, and you wanted to, to live as well as you could and as good a life as you could, or? Well, one of the things that worried me from the beginning of my life was that my own father died when I was 13, and my own father was 40 years of age. I wanted to live. I, um, I wanted to live, and so why shouldn't the other people live in my pictures when they were killed, you know, unceremoniously murdered in shop doorways in Beirut and places like that? So, you know, I've had a pretty all-round um, kind of education in death. Uh, I, I am not a... I don't consider myself to be like an undertaker, but I certainly have had a close-up close look of, of people dying who shouldn't have died. You know, and what you said earlier about, you know, the politicians are the people who kill these people. It's their bad decisions. It's their, their kind of, they're also, you know, people who are trying to, in, you know, climb up the, up the tree, so to speak. So there's a huge immoral kind of goings on here, really. So I, I've tried to, play my role so that... You've said somewhere that the photography is the truth, that, you know, in a sense, a journalist can, can, can wheedle words or politicians can, can massage situations or, or stoke up passions, but a straightforward documentary photograph, while it can be fiddled, has, a, has an element of truth, an can, un unbreakable truth. It can be fiddled today because digital photography can be manipulated like you can't imagine, but, um, you know... Some of the great photographs that we've remembered in our lives is the girl running down the road in Vietnam, in Vietnam who later became an ambassador uh, to Canada from the Vietnamese. Um, this girl running with the palm, no the skin on her back. It was taken by a friend of mine. No, sorry, no, it was taken by a Vietnamese photographer. But I mean, that picture and the most important picture as well was the man, the police chief shooting the man in the head in Saigon during the Tet Offensive. That never stopped the war. The war went on seven years after, after that, that photograph. So that's why I'm saying, did, did we stop? Did we change? And I, I still believe we didn't, really. We've got five more minutes. Do you want to just quickly run through? This, uh, is, Northern, this is now you back in, in, a, in a British conflict. Strange enough, I'm in my own environment in Northern Ireland, and this, the British soldiers are now about to... Uh, absurdly dressed as Japanese samurai warriors with leggings, which you'd never catch a, an 18-year-old youth in that outfit. So, um, but I, I was, you know, gassed on a regular basis here and hit with rubber bullets and things. And that woman in the doorway, were you aware she was there? When you no, were... but I should have, she did me a huge favor being there because it's <laughs> the thing that's made the picture, the shock of the woman in the doorway. And this, this city is a very ugly place, you know, housing estates, which, which are a natural breeding ground for discontent and, uh, you know, the whole thing in a way. Uh, look, what I'm saying today is, is that from the age of 15, I've had this extraordinary journey, which has brought me into, into confrontations all over the world. I'm still a, as confused now as, as I was at the age of 15. And what you mentioned you're now, earlier... You're just, just, you're now 80? I'm 80 now, yes, yeah. but I mean, what you said and still, earlier... And still work. I still work. I do a lot of landscape in England around the house where I live in Somerset. But you said earlier about politicians. They speak a language that no linguist can really get to the bottom of. It, it suits their convenience to deceive us. You know, when they talk about things being fruitful and nonsense like that, it makes me so angry that I want to kick the television in when I'm watching it. Um, I know that we're constantly being deceived by these people. Uh, these are the people who we put into power thinking they can help change our world, and they've failed bismally. Can we run through, we've got five minutes, have we got the... Um Ah, is, yeah, this, I remember this age 15, this photograph. This is Beirut, huh? Yes, this is... Um, I was in a, a huge massacre in East Beirut when the Christian phalange, which was quite extraordinary when you think of the word Christian, 
many of them wearing the, you know, the crucifixion, and, uh, decided they would clear the Palestinians out of this area. And um, a man came up to me and he put a blue ribbon around my neck and I said, what's that for? He said, that's in case of one of our men killed you by a mistake. You know? So I don't look like a Palestinian, that's for sure. But however, they went into this area and it was, it was the, the kind of cleansing of something you wouldn't even want to contemplate. The, and he's got a loot in his hand. Is it a this is, I was told to leave the area because I was seeing groups of Palestinians being murdered in groups. And then the, the commander said, leave the area, otherwise I'll kill you. And I thought, well, if you can do that, I take you on your word. So he said, you leave the area, you take no more photographs. And I was walking down to leave the area, and I heard music, and I thought, how bizarre. And I looked up, and I saw these young uh, Christian Falange boys um, celebrating the death of this um, young Palestinian woman lying in this winter rain. And um, I took this one photograph, and. And it's most haunting. It's image. almost a kind of medieval painting in a way. It's um, one of those Piero della Francesca's of the Annunciation with the angel with the thing. And yet it's the body. Just to give you an idea what I do on my time off, this is the, the winter light coming through my kitchen in Somerset. In a way, it's played a great deal to, to kind of heal my, my thoughts. Of, you live now in one of the most beautiful places in Britain, in, in this extraordinary um, valley. I know, but the trouble is that, you know, in England we are a much overcrowded island and we need to build houses and one day, it's not going to happen in my time because there's not much time left for me, but uh, my, my wife had said, you know, I'm f afraid they're going to build houses in this valley. Um, but I do love where I live and I, I have an old shed in the garden I had, it's been knocked down, where I would do these these kind of almost Dutch still lives. They, there's more to me than meets the eye. I do landscape, I do this, I can do all kinds of things. Um, I was commissioned by the English uh, Postal Service to go to the, the battlefields of the First World War in France and I, I had a lunch in a little bistro and it was raining and I was, uh, sometimes you, you meet a kind of dead end in your life and it doesn't work out that day. And I was driving back to my hotel and I saw this road it's the road to the Somme battlefield, where on the first morning of the great Somme battle, 30,000 English soldiers died before 8 o'clock in the morning. And among, the, it, among them, my great uncle. You lost somebody. Who got caught on the wire and then gassed. This is in my village. This is a, a small pond. And I always photograph in the evening when the light's going down. And do these landscapes, in the end, do they act as a, um, a sort of coda after the loud orchestra, the, the loud orchestral symphonies that have gone before? These, these, yeah. these are my tranquilizers. Like these, these are, I can stand in these fields for hours and hours and get no photograph, and I don't come away disappointed. I think being there is a privilege, even if I'm cold and hungry. Uh, the best experience I had recently was to stand on Hadrian's Wall, which the Emperor Hadrian built across the north of England because he was afraid of the Picts and the Scots. And I stood there on the wall, which you're not supposed to do because you're not supposed to stand on the wall. But uh, I stood on the wall and a blizzard came and I jumped down and I had two bananas and a flask of hot chocolate. And I was laughing to myself. I, I was so <laughs> thrilled with the, the decision of being there. And it was my reward, it was my payoff, you know, having things that please you. I'm not looking at anybody dying, I'm not having to hide because thousands of bullets are trying to take my head off. So, um, you know, my time of life now, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not looking for reward, but I don't mind it. Do you sometimes think of all your, I mean, you mentioned in the last session that a thousand journalists have been killed in the last 10 years. Yes. Do you... Do you you got once badly wounded, didn't you, in, in Africa? Not terribly badly wounded, but it gave me a wake-up call. This was in Cambodia. And I, I, I lie in bed in the hospital, and, and I had one book, and I thought, I've got to really save this book. I rationed myself every day. And it was a book by a man called Laurie Lee, and it, it was as I walked out At one summer morning. morning. Yeah. It was about him yeah. going to the Spanish Civil War. And um, I remember people coming in with my breakfast, and because I couldn't speak French, they were 
trying to teach me French about the butter and the jam and the <laughs> coffee. So in a way, and I could hear the crunch of artillery getting closer and closer to the city. Uh, and in a way, if I wasn't a photographer, had I been more educated, I think I wouldn't have made a bad writer, really. But of course, I'm dyslexic and I can't spell. <laughs> I can't either. Uh, by the way, this is the view I, I wake up to every day in my life. It's from the terrace of the house where me and my wife, Catherine, we live and we look at this. Um, this view. So, in a way, I'm not under privilege. This, this is closure. This is, yes, it yeah. is. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a big round of applause for Don McCullen? <laughs> we have time for we have time for a few questions. Front row. I'm a bit deaf, so I'll be busy. Um, you said that you don't think your work changed anything, ultimately, looking back. Can I just ask you, what drove you to keep going in that case? Because I love photography, and I love the idea of... I, I mean, I told you I've just been to this huge festival. By the way, I have to tell you, India's my greatest love in the world. Of all the countries in the world, I love this country more than anything. I first came here in 1963 with a very uh, distinguished travel writer called Eric Newby. And so I fell in love with India. And, you know, I, I, I don't believe, honestly, it's not a stump for me saying this, but I don't believe my work has changed in the minds of people who understand, who feel the same way themselves, but it hasn't really converted anybody outside of that area. That's why. So, you know, I, I flog on doing what I do, but now I'm taking a U-turn on that and just concentrating by the way, I want to show you these pictures. Temple of Bell. This is, the, this is Palmyra, which the ISIS people have been destroying. And I'm sure there's somebody in this room who's been to Palmyra. Um, I have. And in the background of this picture, there are some funeral towers, which ISIS have blown up. Um, this is the Temple of Bell, which they've blown up. And it's a tragedy, really. Even though the temple was partially reconstructed, they'll never get those stones back for a second time to reconstruct. They'll be in fragmentation. So in a way, I still have a useful voice in my visual photography. Um, but what good is that going to do about something that can never be replaced? 2,000 years on, you know, these people have destroyed this site. One last question. The lady's got a hand up at the back here. Thank they, you. Thanks. They've had enough. No, this, your <laughs> Thank question. you very much. I, I, um, so we live in Africa, and I'd just like to ask you what your responsibility is in the, pic, um, the pictures that you've printed of Africa. I think you've done um, pictures of people with HIV and AIDS in South Africa, for example. They're the pictures of Biafra, the pictures of Ethiopia. And many people feel that those because those pictures are... are um, uh, shown mainly in rich countries, that that's the lasting image people have of Africa, and that they would like photographers to also publish more positive images of what's good about many countries in Africa. What, what's your responsibility in portraying Africa as starvation and war and corruption? So the question is that um, some people get upset with Africa just being portrayed as a place of starvation, mm -hmm. HIV, um, backwardness. I said, do you have responsibility to show a more positive sign, side of Africa? First of all, I think, you know, the idea of actually showing those pictures in the first place will bring some kind of aid. That's the first part of the question that I can answer. The other side, you're quite right in a way, we don't really see any positive sides. I mean, you know, they haven't invented any great thing that you know, we've applauded them for. So. I think Africa, I always thought that I would probably never see peace in Africa for the next 50 years, but it's, it's calming down to some extent and things are changing gradually, but it's going to take a long, long time. Um, but do you we, feel, I mean, I, I suppose to, to take the question out, while you can um, make a difference by revealing the extent of HIV and, and make people reach their purses, do you feel any responsibility um, to show, you know, to, to show the more positive things of life. I mean, I suppose the landscape, but... 
Oh, well. no. I've, I've, done, I've done the cultural side of Africa. I did a book about the tribes of the Omo Valley in southern Ethiopia. I mean, there's still the cultural side of Africa, which we're, we're all you know, delighted to look at and see, but that's not good enough. Um, we have to condemn the people who flood Africa with the AK-47 rifle, which brings about the misery and you know, the lack of progress, and, and, and it scales up the, the, the tragedies that take place there. So it's a good question, and you've got me slightly foxed, I have to say. I wish I could answer it in a much more you know, defined way. I can't, because I haven't seen a great deal of positiveness coming out of Africa. That's because you get sent, I mean, the way journalism works is you don't get sent to sort of cover you know, lovely things. You, you, well, that's, you, yeah, yeah. that's quite true. What William said is that you go for the negative when you go to Africa as a, as a, re, as a reporter. You, you don't go there, you know, to, to talk about the, well, whatever. You go there always the, for the, the negative. New, the new stock exchange in, yeah. in St. Johannesburg. Or, so yeah. thank you for your question in the first place, because you basically almost answered it by making me say negative things, because that's, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> very confusing. One, let's have one last more positive question to end. <laughs> Please, gentleman with the scarf on. Peter Frankfurt. Uh, well, hopefully a very positive question. To give us mortal, utterly spellbinding, that's made my, I mean, it's just spellbinding. Uh, how many bad photos you take to create a good one? What, so what's your hit rate, in a sense? My what? How, what, it, what's your hit rate? How many bad photographs do you take to create these uh, one magical? I mean, are you, something like the Tet Offensive, you, I mean, you, were take, you were there two weeks and you took maybe 100 iconic photographs. I got some very good pictures, yeah. I mean, it, it all depends how the events pan out. You know, you, I, if you're in a huge battle for two weeks, you're going to get you know, a hell of a lot of pictures. But you know, I've made many trips to Africa and come back. The war in Biafra was, can I use the word which might sound obscene to you, or was easy. When people are dying in front of you and, and starving in front of you, I could photograph those people with my eyes closed. So it was easy to photograph in one respect, and it was bloody awful to stand in front of dying children whose legs would barely carry them. I, I'm, I know morally where I belong and how I am expected to behave. You know, I'm. I've been amongst journalists who behave incredibly badly. Once in Beirut, there was a, a mental hospital in Sabah Shatila camp, Palestinian, which was being shelled by Israeli gunboats. Um, there was one noble nurse who stayed behind for the five days, but the first thing she did was tie all the mental children patients to the beds to save them crawling amongst the broken glass and being cut to pieces. But those children were starved, they had no water. And then she said to me, oh, um, I'll show you something else. And she opened the door and out slid some two-year-old blind children, mentally, mentally uh, insane and blind. They looked like newborn kind of mammals. They slid out in their own nest in a temperature over 45 degrees. And she so locked them in a room, she? She locked them in the room. She tied the other children to the beds. And I photographed the children tied. And in the background, I found a little boy playing with some debris as if he was playing with Lego. And I photographed him. And I thought, there's nothing that you know, won't surprise you when you photograph war and tragedy. There is always something that will totally take your, your feet away from you. So I don't even know how to go on any more talking, because I, I think that um, why was it me that was t chosen to have this life? I didn't, I don't know. And I did it without any do you, education. Do you sleep easy at night? Do you wake up sometimes and see the Tet Offensive or the Afro? Oh, I used to. I don't know. No, I go to bed very early at night and read, and that sends me to sleep. Just reading and sliding off to sleep is a joy. But as you get older, you wake up earlier, you see, so it defeats the... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Don McCunnan, please. <laughs> Thank you. We wish to thank our speakers, Dal McCullen and William Dalrymple, for the session.
coming up next a better Pasha freeing the world at 12.25. The other sessions, the peace to end all peace at Charbagh, India at play, Rajni Ganda Silver Pearls front loans, the healers, ideas of well-being at Google Mughal Tent, Bernini's beloved love jealousy in Renaissance Roma, Rome at Mahindra Humanities Darbar Hall, and some ways not to write a poem, Fort Samvad. <laughs>